Welcome back grade 11s, let's dive right in. So, you want to implement for loops properly in your code. Let's take a look at how these work. A for loop is a wonderful tool for us. The key word here to keep in mind is a loop. Now, I hope you know kind of conceptually what a loop means. It means it kind of goes around and around and around until at some point it has to stop. Essential to this idea is that it needs to stop at some point. A loop that doesn't have an endpoint is an infinite loop, and no one is going to be very happy with that, particularly our coding programs. So we have to set up a few pieces of information to decide upon the conceptual space of this loop. Now I'm just going to kind of give us an, uh, a metaphor here. Consider the idea of Simon Says. And let's say Simon Says, turn around three times. Now, Simon did say, Simon says, so you're allowed to do it. Let's make sure we're clear on that. How is this loop going to look to get us or, or actor or whatever to actually turn around three times? So I first of all want to think about the internal components of this loop. What is the action, the body we call it, the action that's occurring? Well, I want to turn. Let's say I have a method that turns me. And I just can reference it. So I want to turn. But I want to turn around three times. Now, I could do this. Turn, turn, turn three times. But where's the fun in that? What if this number was instead like 3,000? Copying and pasting this 3,000 times would suck. Why don't we just do 3,000? Because that might help us out. Realize the importance of this. So I want to turn. But I want to do it 3,000 times. So I'm going to use a loop to do this for me. I'm going to say for... Now, I'll make a note of the different components here. For the initial condition, I want to go through um, the uh, end condition, and I want to see how the change between each condition. Ooh, let's make sure this goes all the way over. So here's kind of what we can conceptually think of this. Where are we starting? What is the limitation or where is like our end point so it doesn't go on forever? And then how much changes between each time this goes through? Here's how I'm going to set this up. I'm going to always define a new integer. We often say I, but it could be A or it could be Bob or it could be name. You can name it whatever you want. But I is kind of the way we tend to work with um, for loops. And I'm going to start it at zero. So I'm starting, I have not done any turns yet. What is my end condition? What's the limit for what I'm going to be doing in this scenario? Well, I want to turn 3,000 times, no more than that. So I want to say that I, the, the number of times I'm going through this loop, is less than 3,000. So don't go past that point. Now you might be wondering, don't I want to do it a 3,000th time? Well, we will here. If we start at zero, then we have to do less than the total number. If I want to do less than or equal to, I need to start at one. Small difference. I'm going to write it this way for now. So I start at zero. I haven't turned any times yet. Then I'm going to turn up to 3,000 times. And after each time that I turn, I want to go to my next attempt at turning. Here's how this would be processed. For start at zero. Is it less than 3,000? Yes. Perform the action. Once that's done, move on to the next step. I is now one. Okay, so now I, technically because of this, has been set to one, the next option. Is it less than 3,000? Yes, it is. So turn. Increase I again. Now it's two. Is that less than 3,000? Yes. Turn again. That's... 3, less than 3,000, turn again. 4, now I can sit here up until 3,000. But once it reaches 3,000, this will end and it won't turn anymore. And what will have happened is you'll have turned 3,000 times. Let's think of another example. The Indy 500. This is like a race car uh, competition, if you know anything about it, where they have to go around a track 500 times. And let's say in my code, I have a method that's called do a lap. 
I could copy and paste this 500 times, or I could use a for loop. Any 500, 500 laps. I want to do the lap 500 times. Let's choose A for our variable name this time, just to be crazy and out there, really unusual. All right, so int A, let's say we start with zero laps done. What is the limit for this? A is going to be no more than 500 laps. The competition is over. If I've done 500 laps, I've reached the end. So why would I do more? It'd be a waste of fuel. People would look at me funny. That's the end point for this. And then I'm just going to go up once each time. Each time I do a lap, move on to the next lap. So I'm going to loop through all 500 laps in my Indy 500 race. Okay, maybe that's enough for some of these metaphorical alternate scenarios. Let's take a look at what I've done in my code to implement a for loop. Recall that I added the floor in my world, which automatically stretches the floor across the whole space that I create for my world. Here's what I've done. I've added in a block. That is the name block of the platform that I've added in, the subclass of platform. Specifically, it's a class called block. So I'm just going to create a new one. Now I'm going to get some information about it. I'm going to get the width of this block. How do I do it? Block get the image from it, and then I'm going to get the width from that image. I've chained these methods together, which I'm totally allowed to do. Get the image of the block, and then get the width of that image. I'm going to do the same for height. Get the block, get its image, and get the height. Assign it to block height. And now what I've done is I've done some generalization. Num blocks floor. This tells me how many blocks can fit in my world. I'm going to get my world's width, and I'm going to divide it by the width of the block. And that number is going to be how many blocks can fit on my screen, so that I make just enough to fill the whole width of my screen. All right, so now what I'm going to do, what is my action here? This time I'm not turning or spinning, I'm not doing a lap, I'm adding a block to my world. Add object. Each time I add an object, what am I adding? A new block. And what's the x coordinate I'm adding it at? Well, it's going to be whatever step of the loop I'm at times the block width. The first time, well, maybe starting at 0 is a bad idea here, because 0 times block width is going to be 0. Oh, no, actually, that would be fine, because I'll st that means I'm adding it at the very left part of my screen. <clears throat> if I have 0, whatever my block width is, it's OK, because my first x position will be 0. And get height the height of the world. So that means get height is all the way at the bottom, the very bottom edge of my world. But I'm going to back up by half of the block's height so that the block is going to be added in just touching the very bottom edge of the screen. A nice, clever way of guaranteeing it's exactly where I want it to be in a generalized manner. So for having zero blocks all the way up to having the maximum number of blocks I'm allowed, and then each time through the loop, just move on to the next step. I'm going to add as many blocks as is needed. And this is going to be beautifully generalized because of this right here. The number of blocks is based on the width. So if I change the width up here, then it's going to change how many blocks. I can fit more blocks if the width gets bigger or less if the width gets smaller. It automatically calculates it for me. Awesome. I've also added in, just to wrap up for now, this method for triple blocks. I'm going to be a bit faster here, but notice it takes in two parameters, the x start and the y start. I can tell it where I want it to add a grouping of three coin blocks in my world just by telling it where the starting point is. So here's how it's going to go. I'm going to grab a coin block, and here I'm just interested in the coin block's width. I'm getting the image and the width of the coin block so that I can put them side by side really nicely. I don't really care about the height because you'll notice later I'm adding in the, uh, my height is going to be whatever my y start, or you know, my y location is just y start, so I don't have to worry about the height here. So what am I doing? I'm adding a coin block. Where am I adding it? Well, I'm adding it to the x location I requested, but then each time through my loop, my a will change. So the lo there's going to be three blocks. The first one right at x start, because a will be 0. The second one at block width. And the third one at 2 times block width. And then the, each one will be added at the same y level, y start. The loop starts at 0 blocks added. 
up to three blocks added, and then increment through to make sure the loop runs each time. And the result of that is three blocks being added into the world. To wrap this up here, just to show you um, how this might be kind of different here, um, what if I said, when I reference it, so triple blocks, I said get width divided by two, get height divided by two. What if I just said, make the width 100? What's gonna change in my code here? See if you can anticipate what it's gonna look like. It added three, beginning at x equals 100. Now that looks ugly here, if I'll move this out of the way, but uh, these blocks, when they're created, are going to be bound together. And I can use this strategically to add in lots of different layers of different patterns of things without having to type in too much code myself. By being clever, I can use four loops to repeat patterns for me and automatically generate those objects. And you're gonna to want to, and in fact, you're required to use them in some way in your own projects in how you set up your world, which you're gonna really appreciate once you make this thing stretch much further and have lots of repeated different sections of things. All right, hope that helps. Do note that there's written examples of this stuff for for loops in your PowerPoint notes for this section. Ask me for help if you need it. Give some things a try, experiment a little bit. In the next video, we're gonna talk about collision detection. See you then.